Welcome back. Uh, so now I'll be discussing regarding uh, MCQs and how to tackle MCQs on various competitive exams. For example, it can be any exam. Let it be any uh, any exams of your home country or other countries that you're trying to attempt the licensing examinations. What doesn't change is medicine. Okay, let it be any exam. Let it be the MLEs, the MC, the AMCs, your home country examinations your PG entrance examinations, your screening test, medicine will not change. So why am I telling you this? Because ultimately if this is clear in your head that medicine is what, has, what is that, that they are going to ask you, what do you have to do? You have to just fine tune whatever you have studied in your medical curriculum so that you can cater for those examinations and fine tune in such a way by reading few M uh, those MCQs that they have been asked in the previous years so that you can train your mind you know to those MCQs so this is the training process that you'll have to go through okay you don't have to read medicine all over again but yes you have to study those concepts which are not clear or make your or consolidate your concepts that you have learned in your medical curriculum so this is very very imperative for you to understand that medicine will not change okay so how to tackle these mcqs so my attempt here will be to show you a few mcqs the way they have been asked okay and i hope this uh, attempt of mine will be helpful for you in your future preparation as well so let's look at the first one as you can see on the slide this is a woman she's a 60 year old and she had chest pain and she was later on diagnosed with mi she dies after four days and, and the autopsy which was done at the autopsy they they uh, they saw the transmural infarct and then they later on did the histological finding so they are asking you what would be the most likely histologic finding of this infarct okay now read that question carefully two important points chest pain mi and the histologic finding after four days of the mi so clues are very very clear here okay the patient has already died that's why the word autopsy is there okay and after four days so what is important here is the word mi the chest pain and four days after the mi she uh, she dies and the histologic findings that they're asking so what do you think will be the answer there are five options here fibroblast granulation tissue necrotic muscle and neutrophils granulomatous inflammation and diffuse chronic inflammation now wait don't try to think don't try to read those options you already know this is mi you've given the you're given the information that this lady has died and that is after four days of the chest pain so think what do you think what are the histologic findings of mi are at the fourth day or after four days think in your mind what could be the option what kind of cells do you, uh, do you think will be seen after four days then look for that option with within the options that are given you okay what are the acute inflammatory cells neutrophils right so do you see neutrophils there yes so that is the answer why do you have to bother about the other options right so neutrophils is there macrophages will follow later would you see a fibroblast or a granulation tissue within four no not at all what is the right answer correct answer here neutrophils granulomatous inflammation not in mi then diffuse chronic inflammation mi acute chest pain nothing to do with chronicity right so neutrophils will be the answer here if you answered that that is the correct answer let's look at the next one one line question scared about it or happy about it well, let's see ostium primum type of asd results from failure of yes it's a one line question but it is a tough one for those who don't understand the concept about atrial septal defect right now the same question can be asked as a clinical question as well they might give you a very very big history here and the last line would say the same thing right so the, my, purposely I put this one line here so that I, I could tell you that the same question could present to you as a clinical question where they will talk about the murmur they'll talk about the child having a difficulty in breathing and so on you know all the all the other uh, clinical findings would be given to you and the last line would be the same that the ostium primum type of ASD results from okay so what should be the answer let's look at the answer here septum primum 
to fuse with the endocardial cushions. Now, I would like to explain you the concept about ASD here, okay, which many students don't understand. What happens in atrial septal defect? What is the primum type of defect? What is the secondum type of defect? And so on, okay? So, we'll go on the board right now. So, uh, how, do you how do you explain ASD, right? For this question that you have seen already, it is asking you the primum type of ASD and how does it, how does, how does it result? So we saw the answer to be septum primum to fuse, uh, inability of the septum primum to fuse with the endocardial cushions. So let's look at the diagram here. Now what happens that if you imagine this to be the primitive atrium, okay? Septum primum go, grows from the wall of the primitive atrium towards the endocardial cushion, okay? So this is the first septum which is growing from the wall of the atrium. That is why it is called as a septum primum. What happens is, when it is growing towards the endocardial cushion, okay, there is a natural gap which occurs, okay, and this natural gap is known as foramen primum, right? So please note, foramen primum is not any hole, okay? It is a natural gap that exists before the septum primum fuses with the endocardial cushion and this is in the primitive atrium, this is in the embryonic life. Okay, so eventually what is going to happen? This septum primum is going to fuse with the endocardial cushion, right? And you know already that in the embryonic life, we have the right to left shunt that exists. Okay, the right side is more oxygenated as compared to the left side, right? That is in the embryonic life. So what is going to happen is, when the septum primum fuses with the foramen primum, is there going to be in communication? No. So then what will happen to the fetus? The fetus might die. Isn't it? So what happens is, when the septum primum fuses with this endocardial cushion, as it is seen here, there occurs a natural apoptosis. Okay? And this is called as apoptosis. This is a hole. Okay? So where is this apoptosis happening? It is happening in the septum primum so that you have the communication from the right side to the left side going on in the embryo otherwise the embryo will die getting it so when the septum primum fuses with, with this endocardial cushion your foramen primum is closed okay when the septum primum fuses with the endocardial cushion foramen primum is closed then what happens is there occurs a apoptosis apoptosis is programmed cell death Okay, there's a difference between apoptosis and necrosis. Okay, necrosis is not a programmed cell death. Okay, necrosis is also cell death. But necrosis is not a programmed cell death. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. Necrosis is due to inflammation, infection and so on. And this is going to be helpful to the embryo so that you have the communication going on. So naturally we have to name this uh, apoptosis which is happening in the septum primum. So we name it as foramen secundum. So where, where is foramen secundum? Foramen secundum is within the septum primum. Okay? Foramen secundum is not in the septum secundum. Foramen secundum is occurring in the septum primum so that you have a communication going from the right side to the left side within the embryo. Okay? So now you can see this septum primum is a very thin septum. Okay, we need to support it and if you have noticed within the atrium, some part of the atrial septum is thicker and some part is thinner. So how do you, how do you justify that in the adult atrium where the part of the septum is thicker and part of the septum is thinner? There comes your septum secundum. Okay, so what is septum secundum? This is your septum secundum which is occurring on the right side of your septum primum and you can see I have drawn it in blue. And it is much thicker septum as compared to septum primum. Can you see it is kind of supporting the septum primum? Right? So you can see if you, if you, if you look at this complete uh, septum here, you see this portion of the septum is much thicker whereas this portion of the septum is thinner. Right? So what is happening is septum secundum is overlying. It is growing on the right side of the septum primum. It is much thicker septum 
and it, it grows along the right side of the septum primum. But wait, have a look here. What happens when the septum secundum is growing on the right side, as it grows, it is overlaying the foramen secundum. So when, again, if this happens, and if this stops here, right, if we stop here again, the embryo will get killed, right? Because what are you doing? You are discontinuing the flow here from the right side to the left side because you are overlaying the foramen secundum. So then something else should happen, isn't it? Otherwise the fetus will die. So what happens? You already know that in the fetal life, the right-sided pressure is very high as compared to the left side in the fetal life, not in the adult life, right? So what happens is, because the right side, the pressure is more, we have the more arterial blood. So this pressure will push the thin part of the septum primum towards the left side. Can you see this part getting pushed? Not this part, okay? Because this part is supported with your septum secundum, okay? So this part which was thin gets pushed because of the pressure more on the right side and that creates your foramen ovale, okay? So this is your foramen ovale which exists in all embryonic life so that you have the right side blood going on to the left side and the communication is on, okay? Now having said that, it will be very easy for you to understand the two types of defect that we see in ASD, okay? So what do you mean by primum type of ASD? It will be very easy for you to understand. Primum type of ASD occurs, as the question had asked you, the failure of the septum primum to fuse with the endocardial cushion. You can see that, right? The septum primum has not fused with the endocardial cushion. So you have the primum type of ASD and therefore you see the left to right shunt occurring through the primum type of ASD, right? What is the secondum type of ASD? Secondum type of ASD occurs when this apoptosis, okay, which is happening here, when this apoptosis is so large, is so large that even the septum secundum cannot overlay the septum primum. The apoptosis occur, occurs, but it is too large. So therefore you have the secundum type of ASD. Is that clear now? So ASD, VSD, PDA are all left to right shunt. Okay, will they give you cyanosis? No, they will not give you early cyanosis, but they might give you late cyanosis. Okay, they are usually called as acyanotic congenital heart diseases. So which are the cyanotic congenital heart diseases? All the T's. Let me tell you, transposition, truncus arteriosus, okay, tetralogy of phallets, and tricuspid atresia. So that was the second question. Let's go on to the third question. So look at this question here. It is talking about a complete failure of the septum which is developed, the spiral septum in the developing fetal heart. And they're asking you which of the congenital heart defects will it result. Now again, pay attention to the concept here. You know the embryology of heart very well. You know that there's a septum. It has to come. It has to meet with the muscular portion of the ventricular septum so the part of the muscle the part of the ventricular septum is membranous and the part is muscular so this ap septum when it joins with the muscular portion of the ventricular septum it has to turn right when it when it is joining and that turn is be, is because of the spiral it, it has to turn at a one, 180 degrees angle that that's why it is called a spiral septum so what are the importance of the spiral septum and the septum first of all when you have that septum coming in, so let's say this is the muscular portion of the membrane of the ventricular septum. This septum, the AP septum, when it comes, it has to turn at an angle of 180 degrees and then come and join the muscular portion of the ventricular septum. So there are two aspects here. What if this septum is not coming in? So that means if you do not have the septum coming in, what will happen? You will have a common trunk. Right? So what is that term known as? Persistent truncus arteriosus. What if the septum comes in but doesn't take a turn? Then you have another anomaly. What is that anomaly? 
you have transposition of the great vessels. What do you mean by transposition of the great vessels? That means the aorta will come from the right side and the pulmonary trunk will come from the left side. My point here is to make you understand that if you know again the concept of the AP septum and its development, you can not only tackle the MCQ of persistent truncus arteriosus, of transposition of great vessels, but also of the override, overriding aorta. So can you imagine that one concept can generate so many questions? That is the point I am trying to make here. Just one concept about the AP septum generated three questions, right? You had persistent truncus arteriosus, transposition and overriding of aorta. Where do we see overriding of aorta? Yes, tetralogy of phallus. Again, in tetralogy of phallus there are four aspects. But what? who is the main culprit there? The AP septum. Isn't it? Just to explain you in, 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 in a short fashion what happens in tetralogy of phallus, this AP septum, instead of coming in, it divides, it goes on slightly onto the right side. It doesn't join with the muscular portion of the ventricular septum. So what do you have here? Pulmonary stenosis on the right side. Because of that, your right ventricle has to work harder. So what do you have? Right ventricular hypertrophy. Because this AP septum is not meeting with the muscular portion, what do you have? VSD. Right? And why do you have overriding of aorta? Aorta is not overriding anything. We call it as overriding of aorta because now the aorta will receive blood supply from both the sides. So it is overriding the ventricular septum. So can you imagine, this is, this is, the, this is the point I am trying to make. One concept about AP septum generated so many questions, right? So if your concepts are clear, you can answer them, okay? So this, is, was, this was the answer for complete failure, you'll have persistent truncus arteriosus. Let's look at the next one. Here you have a young boy diagnosed with patent uracus. And they are asking you, which is the adult remnant of the fused uracus? Many questions are framed on these kind of adult remnants, okay? Uh, you, must, you must remember in embryology of heart as well, you need to know the adult derivatives, okay? Similarly, the fetal blood vessels, what are the adult derivatives? The fetal blood circulation. This question is also framed on the same fashion. So you need to know what were the embryological names and what were the adult names, okay? Now here you will get confused between the point C and point D. Point C is medial umbilical ligament and median umbilical ligament is point E. So what should be the answer here? Median umbilical ligament. The point I am trying to make here is you will get some questions which have options so close that because of the time shortage or because of the anxiety you might choose a wrong answer. So you have to be very very clear. This is why whenever you attempt any MCQ, don't look at the options first. If you are thorough with your concepts and if you are thorough with your knowledge, think about the option first and then look for that option in your, uh, in your option list. Okay? So if you know the difference between medial umbilical ligament and median umbilical ligament, you will not go wrong. What was medial umbilical ligament? That is the adult derivative of umbilical artery. So that's a very, very important point. Right? Similarly, you can get questions on other names or synonyms in pathology kind of questions. Pathology has many, many synonyms. Regional enteritis, right? What is regional enteritis? Again, a synonym for, for the uh, Crohn's. Such like, there are many other synonyms which are used in pathology and these synonyms are used as an option in these MCQs in all, most of the competitive exams. They want to not confuse you, but they want, you, they want to know whether you know the other names of the diseases. Okay? Leprosy. What is the other name? Hansen's disease. So instead of writing option as leprosy, they might put as Hansen's disease. Okay? Let's go to the next one. Now this question is a pure physiology question. The point I would like to stress here is, uh, or I want you to know is, how is a pure anatomy or a pure physiology question asked? The earlier one was an embryological question. But this is a pure, pure physiology question where they are talking about a slow IV infusion of pH solution given to an individual and which of the following nephron segments will pH concentration be the lowest. Now, if you get your knowledge of physiology very clear, this question can be a clinical question as well. You know, 
clearance of pH is equal to the renal plasma flow. So they could talk about a question where they would mention about the renal plasma flow and then in the end they might mention this particular line where they are talking about the normal physiology or they want to ask you about the normal physiology. Right? So in such instances you need to concentrate or you need to correlate your knowledge from the clinical side to your normal physiology side. So what do you think happens with pH? We all know pH is a substance which is completely secreted. Right? And therefore, if you have a, a low concentration of pH, we clear entire of the uh, volume of the pH. Right? We, we almost see all the pH coming into the urine. Right? Eventually, if you look at this diagram, if this is your glomerulus, right? If 20% is coming here as a filtration fraction, 80% which is coming here, Okay, all that 80% at a low concentration will join into the urine. So ultimately, 100% of pH is seen into the urine. Right? So where would you, that means eventually, if you have a slow infusion of pH, almost entire pH will be seen into the urine. So where is the lowest concentration? The lowest concentration has to be into the Bowman's capsule. Clinical point of view, they could give you an individual who has been infused with pH just for his diagnosis of renal plasma, but still, they could frame a question, okay, where the individual has been given a slow infusion of pH and they might ask you a physiology related question and this is your answer, okay. Let's go to the next one. This is a clinical question. This is a young lady with a panic attack, okay, and they are telling you the ABG analysis for this young lady. She has pH of 7.49, PCO2 of 30 and bicarbonate of 24. Okay, this is a kind of a, this is a pure like acid-base imbalance question. Now you know that in acid-base imbalance you have four kind of disorders. Which are the four kind of disorders? First of all, the alkalosis and acidosis and each of alkalosis and acidosis is divided into metabolic and respiratory. So whenever you get a met, uh, acid acid-base imbalance question and you have to diagnose, okay, whether this is acidosis or alkalosis, whether this is metabolic or respiratory, we need to look at three parameters. One is the pH, then is the PCO2, and then is the bicarbonate. Okay? Here they are already giving you the diagnosis that this patient already has alkalosis. Which kind of alkalosis does she have? Look at the pH. pH is 7.49. So is the pH more? Yes, so this pH is more. What is the PCO2? PCO2 is 30. So what is the PCO2, normal PCO2, 40. So what is the PCO2 here is, PCO2 is less and bicarbonate is normal. So what kind of acidosis, uh, alkalosis is this? This is respiratory alkalosis, okay. So if I have to tell you a clue here, whenever you get acid-base imbalance questions, don't get scared, okay. These questions are framed in the same fashion in any competitive exam. Okay, so don't worry that you know you got such so the length of the question is too long, or they have given you some parameters. How do I diagnose? It's a very very simple process. First, always look at the pH. Let's look at the pH first. Whenever you've given a question, first look at the pH. Okay, and then look look at the value and say and arrive at a diagnosis whether it is acidosis or alkalosis. Okay. Then of course these are divided into metabolic and respiratory, metabolic and respiratory. Now for this clinical condition to be having metabolic acidosis, what should happen to the bicarbonate? The bicarbonate should be low. If this has to be respiratory acidosis, what should happen to the PCO2? PCO2 should be high, right? Simple. So first look at the pH. Conclude whether, the, whether it is acidosis or alkalosis, then decide whether it is metabolic or respiratory. Clear? Similarly for alkalosis, what should happen to the pH in alkalosis? pH should be high. Okay? So if you see the pH to be high, then look at the PCO2. If, the, if this has to be respiratory alkalosis, then the PCO2 should be low. If this has to be metabolic alkalosis, then the bicarbonate should be is that simple? So any, let it be any exam. This is the same approach that you will have 
to if you have to diagnose any acid base imbalance. Getting it? So if this patient has alkalosis, now this is they are telling you the diagnosis. You have to treat that patient. The answer should be ask the patient to breathe in a paper bag because she'll breathe her own CO2. Last question. So if you look at this MCQ here, it is slightly framed in a different fashion. Uh, this patient already has hypertension and also has history of renal stones and wants to have a diuretic therapy. The reason why I chose this MCQ is to let you know that this is not a pure, pure pharmac question, if you note. I have just made the question a little bit short, but you can get a very big question here or a one-liner as well on the MCQs. They can talk about the hypertension, they can talk about the side effects of the hypertension and the other uh, complaints that the patient has about uh, renal stones and they are asking to prescribe him a diuretic therapy. So you can, you have to apply your knowledge about pharmacology and a little bit of physiology here as well, okay? You need to know that which are the diuretics which dump calcium in the urine and which are the ones that don't dump calcium in the urine, right? Again, the knowledge of physiology comes here again, right? You need to know the loop of uh, the, the, the loops and what are the transports happening around, along the long loop of Henle and where do uh, loop diuretics act and where do thiazides act? I'm sure you have narrowed down your answers to loop diuretics or thiazides and what should be the correct answer here? It has to be thiazides because as you know thiazides are the only uh, diuretics which will not dump calcium into the urine and hence they will be useful for this particular patient for who, who ha already has uh, calcium stones. Okay, similar questions can be framed on loop diuretics as well. Loop diuretics also have uh, actions uh, where, they, where they dump the uh, electrolytes into the, into the uh, urine and they could ask you a pure physio question or a pharmac question. Okay, so that was hydrochlorothiazide. Now what are the key points, okay, that one needs to, uh, uh, you know, keep in mind while attempting, attempting any, any MCQ? If your base is perfect, if your concepts are clear, okay, and that will not happen in, in a quick revision of uh, reading thousands of MCQs and memorizing them. It will not happen all of a sudden. So whenever you study, pay attention to the concept. We saw a question on AST. Can you memorize that question or can you memorize the answer? Next time the question will change, okay? The examiners might use another option and frame a question from that option. So if you know what is happening with that ASD, you can attempt any question. So the point I'm trying to make here is, if your base is perfect, you can attempt any MCQ related to that concept, okay? So don't worry about, you know, uh, how do I tackle a particular exam because it, uh, the exam has a history of, uh, you know, the clearance being, very, the passing percentage being very less. Don't worry about that. If your base is good, you should be able to do that. You cannot memorize the MCQs, so don't uh, um, enroll into the MCQ banks or don't buy thousands of books just for memorizing them. If you attempt an MCQ, okay, and if at all you get that MCQ correct, that doesn't mean that you, you have understood the concept. You can get it by fluke as well, isn't it? Because ultimately, sometimes you can, you can get an answer by guessing as well, right? So what I would suggest is, Whenever you're studying for any competitive exams, okay, let's say you've solved 10 MCQs in a day, just an example. And if you got five correct and five wrong, okay, all those five correct, what usually happens as an individual, whenever we get a correct answer, we don't look at the explanations. We say, okay, we, I know this concept and let's move on. But that should not be the way you need to study. You need to look at the explanations. Why were the other answers incorrect? Were you thinking in the same fashion as the examiner? Was your thinking pattern matching with the examiner, examiner's pattern? Okay, so you need, to, you need to actually introspect yourself, okay, whether you're thinking correctly while answering that question, which you got correct. Obviously, you'll, when you get an answer incorrect, you will, have an, uh, you will read the explanations of that particular question. But this is particularly happens when students solve MCQs and they don't read the explanations for the answer for the questions which they have got correct okay so please do not memorize the mcqs you need to adjust your mentality to clinical as well as one-liners both can be tough as well as easy we just saw a few of them both again i'm harping again on the same point 
concepts, concepts and concepts. If your concepts are not clear, it is difficult to tackle any competitive exam. Okay, so just a little bit, you know, trick that you can do that whenever you're reading a particular uh, a, a, a theory or a particular book and you go, you go, you're going to appear for these exams, you need to be an examiner yourself. For example, if, if acidosis was a, was a concept that you were reading, be an examiner yourself in the sense, think that if I were an examiner and if I have to ask this question, how would I do that? This is just one way, you know, to get into the mindset of the examiners and tackle the MCQs when they are asked. Okay? Examinations are not designed to fail you. They are there to clear or they are there to test your uh, knowledge. Okay, So don't get into that frame that this particular exam is tough or this particular exam is easy because you, 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 need, you cannot be overconfident as well. Okay, So what are the tips on solving uh, questions? Read each question very carefully. Understand what is being asked. Now, if you remember the question of spiral septum, Okay, if you read it very quickly without understanding, you might choose an incorrect answer. They, are, they were asking complete absence of the spiral septum, right? They were not asking about the spiral septum was not spiral, it was straight. So you can, you can get confused if you are in a hurry. So read the question very carefully. Do not get into the habit of reading the question twice because you will waste time. Okay, think what could be the answer as I said earlier and then look for the answer in the options and then I'll eliminate the incorrect ones, right? And most of these competitive exams that you will appear, uh, they usually do not have negative marking, okay? So if your exam that you're planning to appear does not have negative marking, and if you're stuck at a particular question, do not waste time there. Just guess the answer and move ahead. What I'm trying to say here is, do not leave that uh, answer blank. If there's no negative marking, just guess the answer and move on. Who knows you might be correct okay but that doesn't mean you need to do that for every question okay so I hope this session of uh, tackling MCQs was helpful for you helpful for you and I um, uh, I'm, I'm glad I could share this experience which I had with my students and I hope this will be helpful to you as well for your all your future exams thank you very much